I just want to get a feel for everyone in the room. How many of you, maybe not personally, but your companies have a Facebook fan page or have any kind of representation on Facebook? Okay, I see about a little more than half the room. How about Twitter? And any companies represented on Twitter? So what if I told you to stop doing it? You'd probably look, like, look at me like I was crazy, right? But the fact is that everybody's doing it now. There's, there's been some Forrester research recently that showed in the U.S. where I come from that 99% of retailers have a Facebook fan page. And that's not just airlines. It includes airlines. But we're talking about the pizza guy, the shoe shine guy, the hotels, and everything. Everybody's there. And 91% are on Twitter. So the question becomes, what are you doing there? Are you there just because everyone else is there? Because the fact is, when I go on Facebook, think about why remote controls are effective. When I go on Facebook, you know, when I'm watching television, I have a remote control. I change the channel when the commercial comes on. I don't go on Facebook as a means to, to get advertising stuff thrown down my face. I go there to poke Serena or, you know, look at Joao's pictures from his, his son's graduation in London and, and engage with my friends. So what the question becomes is how can we really add value to that if we're going to be in those spaces and leverage that and understand why people are there and then tie that to our business goals. So as an airline, whether we want to focus on customer relations or crisis management or marketing or anything like that, we've got to figure out what our business strategy and our business goal is and strategically engage social media to do that. So again, we're going to talk about today two paradigm shifts in travel that are happening because of social media and then three ways to drive engagement. Um, again, my name is Steve Klemek. I'm here with uh, Simplifying. Um, we, are, we started as a blog, uh, then we kind of have developed and became a really influential blog, and then we've developed into training. Um, my colleague and I are both uh, certified IATA instructors, so we do training with airlines, we do consulting with airlines, airports, and our goal is to help airlines and airports engage their customers profitably. So we actually, we're young guys, but we do have a board, um, some really experienced people. Uh, Patrick Murphy used to be the chairman of Ryanair, for example. Uh, Donald Shank has done some work in South Africa, so some of you may be familiar with him. And then Chris Brogan is, is kind of known as a social media mogul, in, in a sense. So, and these are some of the airlines and, and airline-related companies we've worked with. Um, so we've done some, some major carriers. We've done, actually worked with Emirates. They're not up here, but Turkish Airlines, but also some regionals like Winair and Air Baltic, Pluna, things like that. And we work with airports and other organizations as well. So, just a little bit about us, but before I take any more time, um, I actually came here from the U.S. I'm, I'm based in Washington, D.C., even though our company is based in Singapore. We're kind of all over. And I pretty much, my accurate residency would probably be 30,000 feet because I'm always traveling. I'm never in one place for more than a few days. And I, I'm really into the social stuff, so I like kind of tweeting that I'm at the airport. And anybody sees that, follows me, you're there, say hello. Um, so let's get going. So the first paradigm shift that I want to cover today is that the cult is in. And what do I mean by cult? I'm not talking about, you know, drinking some magic Kool-Aid and following me into a barn somewhere. What I mean is that CRM, it's kind of funny in the program it says I'm talking about customer relationship management because my goal today is to get you away from customer relationship management because I think the new CRM is actually cult relationship management. And what that means is not so much the customers who are all these little guys up there, but the ones with the arrows over their head that are really the influencers that can do your brand work for you. Um, so again, the cult is in, and I kind of, I just showed this because I want to tie it to South Africa. I should have, after Nico's presentation, just had his picture of the, the uh, boarding card dress. That, that was a great, great example. But the reason I talk about Kalula, this example, we, um, I think it was Jamie showed it yesterday. Um, basically, this was just an idea. Obviously, it's a funny painted aircraft. And this thing came all the way from Seattle, Washington, the States, all the way to Joburg. Before it had ever landed in Joburg, they had tons of media impressions, thousands and, and actually millions of circulations on the, on the web, through Twitter, through Facebook, because they were noticed first by the plane spotter community. So this aircraft is, is touching down. I mean, obviously a 737 can't fly 12,000 miles or whatever it is. It's touching down along the way. The plane spotter community is taking photos. Look at this. They're posting up on airliners.net. It's getting a hold of bloggers, and they're starting to circulate it. And a lot of traditional media organizations, these journalists are actually <coughs> following Twitter as their, as their source for their news now. So this actually had generated quite a bit of buzz for Kalula before it had ever even landed in South Africa. So they really captured those cults. Anybody seen this guy before? I know Adrian probably used to work with Air New Zealand. So this is a, a guy named Rico. 
Um, and I know some folks with Air New Zealand, and, and previously, you know, if they came out with a new fair, any kind of special, if they want to reach 75,000 people, you have to have 75,000 names. And granted, there's traditional customer relationship management systems that allow you to email all those people with the click of a button. But think about the effort that goes into collecting those 75,000 names. So this guy was a kind of a brand spokesperson that was launched by Air New Zealand. His name's Rico. And he generated over 500,000 hits on YouTube almost immediately when they launched him. And I'll show you why. If this offends anybody, I apologize ahead of time, but try to laugh. So, how did you like New Zealand? Oh, <laughs> I think she is taking away my breath. <laughs> her river, her mountains, her animal. I can't breathe. Oh, and I love her bush. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's good she got to look around a bit. Yeah. So, where'd you go? Uh, I spend most of my time beating off the track in many places. Uh, the tasting pleasure, sir? Awesome. Thank you. Oh, this is a life. All we need now is a nice kiwi bitch. Excuse me? You know, like lying around on a white sandy bitch. Oh. <laughs> you can feel her wind. She is blowing you. Rico generated quite a buzz, and there's several of these things. You should check out their uh, Air New Zealand's YouTube page. But the idea being that, do you think they had 500,000 emails that, that their marketing director sent this out to? Of course not. You probably had 50. And that 50 became 5,000. It's kind of, this is what I mean by the concept of the cult. So we have to get away from traditional customer relationship management and think about how the cult is in. Secondly, the traveler life cycle is evolving. And let me tell you for a second what airlines are already really good at. Probably every airline in this room is already really good at booking. So if I want to go online and book, just an example of a Delta booking engine, if I want to go through an OTA site and book, or if I want to just go to a travel agency and book, you guys are really good at taking my money. So as soon as I'm ready to fly, airlines are already good at that. And you're even better at the travel. So if I'm a premium customer, I'm you know Voyager Plus, Voyager Platinum, South African, I have a special dedicated check-in, I know where to go, I follow the signs for the slow lounge, if, if Jamie's in the room, I know it was clearly marked out, I have a short security line, they know that I like the window seat and maybe I got a haircut, uh, that was actually me in my younger days. Um, they know what food I like on board, I'm a priority customer, my baggage attack first comes out, and I'm a happy camper. Unfortunately, that's where the engagement ends. for work. Well, you may want to consider moving to Australia. Well, Australia's Tourism Bureau looking to fill what it is calling the best job in the world. Could this be your new office? Hamilton Island off the coast of Queensland needs a caretaker. Duties include feeding ocean fish, cleaning a pool and collecting deliveries of mail. It comes with a rent-free three-bedroom villa with plunge pool. All this and a salary of about $8,800 a month. As you might imagine, the regional director says response to the ad has been overwhelming. Apart from being a very clever way to publicize an extremely beautiful part of Australia, I think what this position reflects is a, a desire to say to the world, look, this is a wonderful place to come and travel to. And all you have to do is write a weekly blog. That can't be right. <laughs> There's no catch. This is a real job. I'd be very good at it. You'd have to remember to feed the fish. Video applications, including one from the Vatican. 
All applicants have to do is submit a 60-second video to this website, islandreefjob.com. Hi, I'm John, and I'm a police officer in England, and you can tell by the silly hats. I come from the ice tundra of the world. It's really cold here in Connecticut, and I'd love to go to your paradise. My dad was the great entertainer, Mr. Dean Martin. Oh, do you think all we do is eat sausages and sauerkraut? Well, let me prove you wrong, because I'm definitely not one of them. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! Here I am! Here in the north of Sweden, the sea is covered with ice. So if you want to go snorkeling, you need an icebreaker. So we're going to allow the public to vote for their favourite candidate. We'll pick another ten, we'll fly them across to Hamilton Island for a final interview, and then pick the successful candidate. It's very tempting. What do you sign up for that one, yeah, huh? Sounds like tough work oh, there. Watch the whales. <laughs> so if you're not here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they accepted me. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Australia. Yeah, right. Oh, man. Why does the engagement end there? So after that travel experience I just told you about, I booked, I traveled. But then, you know, I might get the next whatever newsletter comes out from the CRM system. I'll get that, but there, as far as the trip that I took, the engagement's over. The reason I showed you this, of course, I'm a social guy, so I want to show you this is kind of regarded as the best social campaign ever run as far as cost effectiveness. However, the bigger picture I want to show you is, I don't think 1.4 million people applied for that because they dream of cleaning fish tanks and collecting mail, which are some of the job duties. I think it's because of the Hamilton Islands itself. It's a dream. It created a dream in someone's mind that got them thinking about the Hamilton Islands. And so this is my goal to help you today try to think about zooming out of this booking to travel life cycle. Because right now, this, this whole dreaming stage, the whole planning stage, airlines aren't really a part of that in most cases. You're letting other people capture the engagement at that point, but it's not really, the airlines don't become involved until the booking touch point. So just to give you another example of the dreaming, my parents actually went on a cruise around Alaska last summer, which is supposed to be really nice, I've never been. Um, but they went home, and of course they have a little neighborhood barbecue, and they're talking about it. And so the next door neighbor, it's, it's a lovely lady named Monica, and her husband Bill, uh, you know, they were started, Monica had mentioned, oh, that sounds really nice, you know, we should think about that. Bill realizes, geez, our 25th anniversary is coming up, I haven't planned anything yet. So they might still go home, he's not, there's nothing to do with an airline right now. He's already had the dream of going to Alaska, but he's going to look at you know, sites like Kayak, maybe start reading reviews. Um, Mon he might mention this to Monica, she's starting to look at reviews on TripAdvisor, things like this. The point being that in this whole planning, planning stage, which is already followed by the dreaming stage, there's not really too much airline involvement in the touch point, and that doesn't have to be the case. So of course then they end up booking, they travel, but it still doesn't end there, because the thing about social media is today we're sharing. I'm not just going on a vacation, taking some photos, and then putting them in a photo album. I'm sharing right now. When I, I was in Singapore recently, and they, I'm sure any airport where they have a lot of those internet stations, you can see this, there's something like 20 computers right there. I actually had to check my previous job, I had to check my email, so I was a little nervous, I had to get on, and 19 of them were people on Facebook. I'm thinking like, come on, people do some work, something, but the point is, people spend their time on Facebook, they're sharing while they're traveling. Nobody's Facebook profile pictures, their passport photos, just, it's of course something more like this, you know, me standing in front of the the Mandela statue down the street. So the point is that we have to try to, as airlines, become part of those other touch points, dreaming and sharing. So as we know the travel life cycle is evolving, does engagement really matter? And you know, as Nico said earlier, one of the best quotes was that you know, a brand name is not just the word, it's the start of a conversation. Well, you can't have a conversation without engaging. It's a two-way thing. So of course it does. So what do we do about it? That's what I'm getting into now, the three ways that we can really drive engagement based on the fact that the cult is in and the traveler life cycles is uh, evolving. So first, we mentioned that the whole, I want you to get part of that zoom out in the dreaming and sharing. So that's an obvious first step. We really have to allow people to dream and share. As airlines, we have to become part of the touch point to not only help them, but really empower them to dream and share. So I have a few examples of, of airlines that are actually doing this today. Anybody a member of SAS loyalty program, Scandinavian Airlines, Euro bonus? Probably, probably not, but they actually have done a really good job of this. So this is what I see when I log in. If I'm a Euro bonus member, I log in, and what it shows me, you'll see a grid of nine destinations here, and they're actually grouped under solo, romance, family. 
And what this is, is besides here is a personal intro, it tells me how many miles I have, and these are destinations that I can actually book right now with the miles I have. So this is an example of kind of becoming part of that dreaming touch point. They're not making me come up with something on my own or through TripAdvisor or something else. They're laying it right out there for me. I can go to Helsinki, I can go to Zurich, I can go to Dusseldorf. Now you might be thinking, of course, like, great, I don't have 50,000 miles in my account. But they also have something where they actually have sort of like stretch destinations. So if I actually wanted to go to Tokyo, but I need 20 more thousand miles, I can click on this little option here, and it helps me see, okay, to get to Tokyo, this is what you need, and here's clear, a clear map of how you can achieve that. So that, who knows, that might make me, next time I'm booking a, a short haul flight, and Scandinavian is, you know, $10 more, I might decide to pay that $10 because I'm already trying to accomplish that dream. And then that's not the end of it. We're talking about sharing as well. So when you click on one of those destinations, well, firstly, the, the description of the city, which is over there on the left, it's not something written by SAS's marketing department. It's actually syndicated for free from sites like TripAdvisor, which, had, as Nico had mentioned, there's a lot more trust from sites like that that are actually written by people, by travelers, as opposed to marketing folks. And then lastly, I can share it. So if I want to go to Helsinki, I can actually click the link here that shares it with anybody that I want to email to, like a virtual postcard. And who knows? They might also be members of the loyalty program. They may have the points. And this is not just my 500,000 people on Facebook or whatever. This is my 50,000 most loyal customers that are actually active in my mileage program. So we got to help them dream and share. Is anybody here familiar with Foursquare? I'm not sure if that's really big down here. Okay, so, so what it does is when I show up at Sampton Convention Center, I have my mobile phone, it picks up where I am, and I can actually like check in virtually. So it's a way of, of kind of telling the world where you are. So something happens when I check in. You, well, first of all, you can kind of try to become a mayor, which is kind of a silly concept, but it's, it's real. And so if the idea is if I've checked into Sampton Convention Center more than anyone else, then I become the mayor. And there's all kinds of marketing things that are tied to this, but I won't get into that. But when I check in, something happens. It basically sends out a notification to my entire social network that, oh, Steve is in Sampton Convention Center. So it's a way of sharing. So what Intercontinental Hotels have done is they've actually, they have a program called Top Guest. It's their loyalty program. And they've linked this with all these uh, social applications like Foursquare, Goala. Goala is the same thing as Foursquare, basically. And every time I check in, I actually get 50 points. When I check in virtually, I'm not talking about as a guest of the hotel. If I'm just walking through the lobby and I check in through my mobile, I get 50 loyalty points. That's not really a huge gift they're giving me but it's a way to get me engaged. It's a way to get me sharing that, hey, I'm in the IHG hotel, it's beautiful, they spend a lot of money in this lobby. So again, it's a way of just getting sharing. We want to really get the sharing. Anybody heard of um, Flip.2? It's actually a website, Flip.to. It's, again, this is not, not so big yet, but what this does, um, this is uh, an example of someone who's using it. It's Lan Airlines from Chile. Flip.2, it allows you to insert something into your booking path. So the same way that airlines are now inserting ancillaries in the booking process, excess baggage, meals on board, whatever it is, you can actually insert a, a link in the, booking in the booking path where they can share. You enable them to share it through their entire social network. So in this case, the person's already searched the flights, he's already found his fare, picked his flight, purchased the flight, put all the passenger input, he's all done. Right before he gets the confirmation, he can now send this little URL out to his entire social network, network tweet, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, anything, as specified by the person. In, in this case, Lon incentivizes them with 500 miles. Now again, we all know in the loyalty program, the breakage rate is pretty high. There's, not a, there's a lot of times where nobody's going to claim, a lot of people aren't going to claim the miles anyway. But what this does is it gives you an advertisement through my entire social network that, hey, I'm flying on Lon. I've become a brand ambassador. Where would you guys guess this is? Amusement park, shopping center. Uh, my first guess was Dubai. I thought it would just be like in the Mall of Emirates or something. This is actually in Changi Airport in Singapore. It's a four-story slide. There's actually two. There's a four-story slide and a one-story slide for adults. And this is, talk about something disruptive. This kind of is similar to that Kalula example where I was talking about engaging the cult or, or the, the mango thing where you guys did the dress and you kind of captured a bunch of audiences. This actually got a lot of public, besides getting a lot of PR through travel blogs and all this. This is actually mentioned in aluminum industry newsletters based on like the construction of the slide. 
it was mentioned in Fast Company magazine about things that are like disruptive marketing. And on the surface, I mean, this does create a dream. It helps you kind of think creatively. And who knows, it may make me, next time I'm flying KL to LA, for example, and SQ and CX are the same price, maybe I'll, I'll take SQ because I want to see the slide. Why not? But actually, I, I don't know if Suresh is here, but I think AirAsia should maybe do this. This might be, I was thinking about this when I was planning the presentation. What if an airline then kind of linked in, joined up with this, and actually, right now, I can use this if I spend $20 in Changi Airport and show the receipts, or if I just pay $5, I can go down the slide. But what if an airline decided to say, hey, we want to get people sharing as well. So they just pay for a couple of little cameras that they can attach to a hat and let people wear them when they slide down, and then have a computer terminal at the bottom where you can post it immediately to YouTube. I mean, you're getting, that's, a, that's what I mean by sharing. That's the kind of thinking that I want people to have as far as really getting yourself established throughout the online networking world. Last example with this one is uh, KLM, and what these are, are luggage tags. Everybody probably has some kind of luggage tag, a lot of them probably are given away at things like this. But this is actually something that KLM invited every single one of their Facebook fans to have for free, where they could actually upload a photo, um, their photo, their kid's photo, their dog's photo, whatever, and KLM would ship them free luggage tags. And again, it's not a big cost to KLM, but what is it doing? Whether or not I'm ever going to fly KLM in my life, every time I drag this back through the airport, I'm advertising their brand for them. So it's a way that they've gotten me sharing the brand. So again, these are just some ways that can get you thinking about dreaming and sharing. So great, we're dreaming and sharing. What's next? Well, we know the cult is in, as I discussed earlier. So we have to go where the cult hangs out. And what I mean by this is the, these people that are social influencers, they're not, there's a little bit of ego involved with someone who thinks that they're important enough to tweet to the world every, every time I'm going to McDonald's or going, you know, it's, these are self-important people. And so they're not going to come to you. You've got to find them. So you have to really meet them on their level. I've actually never been to Argentina yet, hoping to go soon. But I've heard of this cafe called Urban Station, and the fact that I've heard of it, and now everyone in this room has heard of it, says something about their social strategy. But what they've done is they created this cafe a couple years ago, and the owners when they decided to launch, they were thinking like anybody, how do, I want, how do I want my pricing structure to be? Do I want to charge for Wi-Fi? Do I want to charge, you know, have high-end coffees? Do I want to have moderate price coffees? Whatever. What they realized is that the, the cult, the people that they wanted to engage with, they don't really care so much about the coffee. They go to these cafes because they want the Wi-Fi, they want the social element. And so what this place did is they actually started charging $10 to walk in the door. $10. And that includes your power port, your table, your lighting, your Wi-Fi. And they give you free coffee, as much as you want. Free flow coffee, some snacks. But the whole point is they turn the pricing model on its head because that's what their audience really wanted. That's, they met them at their level. And as a result, this place is actually booked months ahead of time. You know, you, you can go on their website, just book it ahead, and, and it's booked. And actually companies, there are small groups of companies that have meetings there. So six or seven people will go in. They each pay their $10, and they spend an hour or two there. Facebook booking. This, Delta Airlines is actually the first to do this, and it, it was actually controversial, which I'll never understand why. Because for me, all they've done is take their regular booking engine and drop it into Facebook. And to me, there's no bad side of having you know, the 37,000 people that like this. That's a big booking opportunity. But that aside, if we've already seen, I gave you the example in Chunky Airport where everyone was on Facebook. If that's where everybody's hanging out, why make them leave that website Go to, open up another window, go to the Delta website, do a book, and then come back to Facebook. Why not just integrate? Let's simplify the process. And Malaysia Airlines has actually taken this one step further. Um, they have this program called MH Buddy. And what it does now, this, <laughs> some of you guys might think this is intrusive, I don't know. But they actually, because you can opt out, but they actually have this program where if you book through your Facebook, it will tell you if any of your friends on your Facebook list are on the same flight that you're on, what seat they're in, Things like that. Now, it also does come with the option where you can change your flight if you find out that one of the persons you don't like is actually on the same flight. But the whole point being that they're, they're leveraging the value of the social space. So they're really adding value to it. Groupon, anybody familiar? It's, I think this is pretty much the same concept as uh, Daddy's Deals that Jamie had mentioned yesterday. Group buying. So we want to sell something in mass quantity. We drop the price 50%. We get a bunch of people in the door. Well, Delta Airlines, they have their premium lounge is called Sky Club. And they noticed that pretty much all of the people using it were male. And they actually wanted to change that. They wanted to try to get some other demographics in the door. So 
they went ahead and they took a $50 value, which again is kind of arbitrary what you estimate the value of your lounge is, but, and they sold it for $22. And this is good for 24 hours. Um, Groupon, any cities where Groupon is active, basically they just have like one deal every day that can be an airline thing, but more, more often it's just any you know, retailer, restaurant, whatever. But 863 people bought this. And these are all women, because well, majority women, because women are mostly the ones using Groupon. But the interesting thing about it is we are, if you research something like Groupon, the breakage rate of these is like 30%. So 30% of the people are not even going to redeem this. So you've already recovered 30% of what you're discounting. And then the other people that pay $22, you're getting them a, a great brand exposure. I mean, you spend a lot of money in the lounge. You're getting people in who would have never gotten in the lounge anyway. You're getting them to pay $22 for you. So it's a way to target an audience and capture it. One more example. Virgin America is a kind of a subsidiary. It's kind of a complicated technical setup, but of Virgin Atlantic. And they're in the U.S., so it's just a domestic U.S. carrier. Well, they launched actually international flights to Toronto last year from Los Angeles and San Francisco. And most carriers, when they start a new destination, they invite their media contingent, they want to get on the news. And Virgin America did a little bit of that. But the more innovative thing they did had nothing to do with an email, invitation, or anything. They actually sent out a tweet that basically invited any the most influential tweeters in Toronto to their opening party, which featured Richard Branson. He was there as a guest and all that. So all through Twitter, they sent out a tweet, and there's a program called Clout, it's K-L-O-U-T, and this actually measures your influence on Twitter, so it's, you can go to the website, it's, I don't know exactly how they measure it, but it has to do with the number of followers you have, the number of retweets, so that's when you tweet something and somebody else thinks it's interesting, so they kind of tweet it to all their network. So Virgin basically invited anybody with a Clout score above a certain amount to come to their opening reception with Richard Branson, and what do you think these people are doing? These are people that are active live right now with their photos. Hey, Richard, click picture. is going out everywhere now to their entire network. And you've already established that these are the people with the most followers. And then, the, the, well, I'll mention one more thing. The very top active tweeters that they invited, they actually gave them a round trip on their first flight. So Virgin America actually does have Wi-Fi on board. So these are people now who are tweeting and things like that from the aircraft. So talk about real brand ambassador type of activities that are going on. Um, the last example under this one I'll give is TripIt. I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with that. It's a way that you can share your travel plans. So what this does, it allows me to say, I've booked a trip to Johannesburg, I'm going on July 10th, and it can go out to my social network. So I can set different levels where, you know, some certain friends, my family, my best friend might see exactly what flight I'm on, and other people might just see that, okay, I'm traveling July 10th. But what it does, it announces those plans to the world up to 42 days before you travel. And now most airline bookings take place from 20 to 2 days before travel. So if you actually think about that, this is information that people are volunteering that right now airlines are not really a part of. But when people are giving you their travel information, and not necessarily book travel, it's a lot of times just an intention to travel. So if somebody says, hey, I'm traveling with my family of three to Johannesburg, what if an airline were to jump in and say, hey, 20% discount if all four of you go, something like that. You've Taken rid of their, you've gotten rid of their price sensitivity. And we all know now, and Nico mentioned this, that people are searching tons of sites now before they're booking. They're searching something like 42 times before they actually book a flight. So there's ideas that if you go where these cult members hang out, there's lots of information that's already available that if airlines were to become parts of those touch points, they can leverage. So finally, because we know that the, we have to help the cult dream and share, we have to go meet them on their level, these are also first movers. These are people who are up with the technology. They want to kind of be the first to do something. So we have to change with them. Because you want to change with the cult because you don't want to look like this guy. I don't know, head in the sand kind of thing. So I'll give you a really good example of this. Uh, everybody's crossed the street before. I think everywhere in the world they have like the zebra crosswalks that are perfectly 90 degree angle. But do any of you actually walk at 90 degree angles when you're crossing the street? Like, I mean, you're going to walk into half the people there, right? So in South Korea, this is what they've done on some of the sidewalks. Just an example of how they've changed with the cult. They realize people are walking at this angle anyway, so why not just adapt to it? Why resist it? Um, kids don't eat vegetables. Is that safe to say in South Africa too? I, I know, I hated vegetables. Now, see, when I was younger, it's kind of, I'm still kind of young, but I was still at the end of that era where my daddy would just take off the belt and 
you know, I'm going to eat my vegetables because otherwise I'm going to get smacked. But nowadays, I think parents, at least in the U.S., are kind of softer. They kind of, you know, there's all kinds of laws against that kind of thing now. So anyway, <laughs> kids don't like vegetables. So there's one company in the States that actually took baby carrots, which kids never want to eat, and put them in packages that look like Cheetos or chips or whatever. And it says, eat them like junk food. And kids started eating carrots. It's all because they changed their way of thinking. They kind of adapted to their audience on their level. Um, and I'll tie one to the airline, since those two are not airline related. There's a website called points.com. And what this does is most people are not a member of one loyalty program. Um, I think I myself am a member of like 12. Even I mean, if I've flown an airline once, I'll still sign up for their loyalty program. Um, but the average customer that travels is a member of six. So that's a good number to remember. So what points.com does is it allows you to con basically consolidate all of your loyalty memberships and say, I have this many points with this airline, I have this many points with this airline, hotel, whatever. So I can look at all that in one place. So U.S. Airways, their loyalty program is called Dividend Miles. And they started doing something where all of their communications, they started sending out to their loyalty members, they did it through points.com forum. Because again, they, that's where they're hanging out and that's how they're changing. So again, it's going where they hang out, it's changing along with the cult. So, one more example, a video for you. Oh, I'm sorry. We're only boarding rows nine and above right now. You'll have to wait. I'm in row eight. Please step aside, sir. It's just one row, but you think it's okay, but... We'll call your row momentarily. Step aside, sir. evaluation time, her review, let's go through the checklist. Was she, did she enforce the rules? Yes. Was she firm with the customer? She didn't let anybody around the rules. Yes. Was she pleasant? I mean, she, she kept smiling, she was courteous, she wasn't impolite. So this is probably your perfect employee. Great score, she's probably promoted, maybe she's overseeing the airport now. But do this today and you're screwed. Because as soon as that guy steps on board, if you have Wi-Fi on the plane, it's going to Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, everything. It's broadcasted. And if you don't have Wi-Fi, as soon as he touches down, you're screwed. Either way, um, a good thing for you to think about, there's actually an average of two people per flight around the world, per flight taking off, that are actually tweeting live. So that, that's pretty significant. So it's going up right now. So you better get it right. You have to be prepared for that. So you have to be prepared to change with the cult. And in that case, that's an example where that behavior, which was you know five years ago, perfectly acceptable customer service or boarding management behavior, that's not acceptable anymore. Um, one other point I forgot to mention about the going where the cult hangs out, actually, I just found this out the other day, which is why it's not in the presentation, but I thought it was interesting. Um, in Los Angeles, it's really known for bad traffic, there's always traffic jams. Well, they had a closure of one major freeway called the 405, it's a pretty famous interstate, you've probably seen it in the movies. But they actually closed down like a five or six kilometer section of it completely for a weekend. Now, to get this out to people, to avoid traveling that way, they actually paid Lady Gaga to tweet it. And she has something like 10 million Twitter followers. That was what they felt was the most effective way to get their message out to the, tra the, the driving local public. So I thought that was interesting. So I'm going to sum up. Um, I know it's lunchtime. I'm sorry. But uh, we've talked about the cult today. And that's the big circle. The cult is where you can really get a lot of influence. And what airlines are good today at is the customer. So if I was to ask you know, somebody from South Africa, tell me your top Voyager members from London and Hong Kong and Singapore, you could probably give me that right away, give me their names or email addresses, whatever. You have, you're really good at that today. But if I was to ask them which of those are active and influential on Twitter, or if I kind of reverse that equation, I say, look at my 50,000 Facebook fans, which of them have actually flown on my airline in the last three months, it's probably not as clear yet. 
So what, what we're trying to do is really help airlines get to a point where you're starting to overlap the cult with the customer, and you're starting to understand the cult just as well as you understand the customer. And so that's really where we need to get to. I'm available over lunch, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. There's a lot of stuff going on in Africa. I, I spoke with some people this morning that were saying the uh, Consumer Protection Act kind of opens up a whole can of worms with sending out offers through Twitter and Facebook. So I'd really be interested to get your thoughts on how things like that are impacting social media for this market. So any questions? Thank you, Steve. Um, I think if we start asking questions, it's going to take the whole day. This is very okay. interesting, and I think it's it's new for a lot of us because um, if I look at the average age in the room, uh, we'll understand why. Um, <laughs> I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm on Mixit. I battle with it, but I do it because my kids are doing it. But you can grab me at any point and be happy to talk to you. Good, Steve. Thank you very much. Well done for a very good.